Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. Welcome to the Docker online meetup on Unikernels. Today we're going to be talking about Unikernels and Docker. My name is Amir Chowdhury. I'm here with Richard Mortier, and we're also joined by Martin Lucina. So what we'll cover today, we'll give, I shall give a brief introduction to Unikernels, some of the ideas behind where they came from and why they matter today, and essentially to give you some grounding. I shall also cover briefly some thoughts around the unikernel workflow, how people typically build and start to deploy unikernels. I'll then hand over to Mort, who will talk more about unikernels and Docker and why that makes sense. And he'll also then give a demo of how we've managed to use the run for unikernel together with the Docker toolchain to make it much, much easier to build, ship, and run unikernels. Following that, we hope to have plenty of time for Q&A. And so let's get started. So an introduction to unikernels. So it helps if we take a step back a moment and think about traditional approaches to building software today. And that typically involves using op traditional operating systems. And operating systems have a lot of code. Linux has over 25 million lines of code, Debian about 65 million lines, and when we get to consumer level software, there's even more. And if you look at the diagram on the right, when you're typically building an application, you need some code, but the operating system insists that you need a lot more. We can have a quick look at what that, uh, another way of thinking about that. So if you have an application, these are typically some of the system libraries that may come with the OS a along with the kernel. However, the application doesn't necessarily need to use all of this code, and yet the code is always there all the time. And this, this kind of approach can lead to problems. And there are two that, we're, that we'll cover briefly today. First of those is unnecessary system complexity. Because with all that extra code, most of it not being used, makes the system a lot more complex to handle. It's a lot more difficult to reason about, to think about what's going on in the system because there's just so much more of it. There's also the issue of a lack of portability because when we build those applications, we end up deeply they end up deeply intertwined with the system APIs. So you end up being very, very closely coupled to the underlying system that you're building on. That makes it very difficult to, port, um, to use the same code elsewhere. Just think a bit more about the system complexity. So if you build an application for a current operating system, it typically involves you making a forced choice of the type of distribution you're going to be targeting and the version and the versions of the libraries that are going to be there. You also then have to think about managing ad hoc application configuration on those different environments. And on top of that, as if that's not enough, you then also have to deal with wider system configuration details, things that aren't necessarily part of your code. For example, firewalls and other system things. And if we take a step back, we, so we realize that current operating systems are designed for many users to run multiple applications simultaneously. And that's great. We've needed that for a long time. But modern architecture patterns, like single-purpose microservices, don't require such features. Typically, there's one application running, and that's it, with one user. The other problem was lack of portability. So traditional systems programming means building services in one environment. And this is related to the tight coupling that I mentioned earlier. However, Modern programmers have to deal with many, many diverse targets, and these are just increasing in number. For example, cloud services is one that we're all quite familiar with. Smartphone programming is another one that's become prevalent in recent years. We can also think of JavaScript as a viable platform to target, which is the browser. And the coming wave of Internet of Things devices is just going to add another thing that people need to think about. And also, just building kernel modules to extend current operating system functionality. Reusing code is difficult across these different environments, largely because the code that you build for each of these, all the assumptions involve tying it very closely to what you're building on. So just a quick summary of the traditional approach. Applications currently rely on a software stack that involves hundreds of millions of lines of code, most of which is not actually used. Code reuse, your application code reuse, is difficult across those, across those environments, and it will become more so, especially as new contexts arrive. 
It's also difficult to get the maximum benefit of modern architecture patterns. So all the discussions that we see today about how we should be building software, if we bring in all the additional baggage that we already have from how we build, how we build for desktops. However, we should recognize that it's great that we can engineer software to make all of this work, and we have done. We've done a phenomenal job of getting to this point. But can we do better? And that's the approach that that's the approach that we'll be talking about. So, can we do better? And if so, how? Well, the first thing we need to do is disentangle applications from the operating system. What that means is up the operating system functionality into modular libraries so that your application can link only the system functionality that it needs and nothing else. And you should also be able to target alternative platforms from a single code base. And this is where Unikernel shine. Unikernels, Unikernels, Unikernels. So these are concepts derived from library operating system technology, which has been developed way back in the 90s. The basic idea is you make operating system components available as a collection of libraries. And we'll talk later about how we get to that point. You then want to be able to link that application code together with your application code with the system libraries that you need at build time. But you only use the libraries specifically required for the application, and you do not pull in the ones that are not required. For example, if your application needs a networking stack, there's a library for that. If your application needs a file system, there's a library for that. If your application doesn't require shell, don't pull in the shell. If your application doesn't require, say, a USB driver, don't pull in the USB driver. And through this process, you produce a single process, single address space image. And that is the image that you can deploy. And you're also able to retarget that image just by switching out system libraries during the build. What that means is you can take your same application code and target it to different environments, different contexts, just by changing the libraries that you're linking against at build time. And there are a number of benefits to this. <coughs> Firstly, we reduce the complexity. Because we're statically linking only the required libraries, where we are removing a lot of unnecessary services and a lot of unused code from the finished artifact. This also helps us increase the speed because those finished artifacts are much, much smaller. We can even boot one of those uh, unikernels within the TCP connection time. And as there are, there are fewer layers, we have much, much lower latency and more predictable performance. We can also get much more efficient resource usage of the hardware that we have today. For example, Mirage OS, which is one of the several Unikernel implementations, um, the app uses 10 megabytes of RAM. Another example would be the Mirage OS DNS server um, is around less than 200 kilobytes and is about as performant as existing DNS servers. And there are other things, other benefits here too. So unikernels facilitate these new design patterns that we're, that we're hearing about. For example, microservices. So microservices are small, self-contained, single-purpose applications. That definition sits quite closely with that of a unikernel. There is also um, discussions that we see about ideas around immutable infrastructure, and unikernels lend themselves to this as well because we can statically link data into the application, further reducing the dependency on external components. You can also store these outputs, those images, into Git, which is a version control system. And that introduces new models for how you can update, upgrade, and triage your application. You can also go as far as sealing these unikernels. You can enable hardware memory protection so the image really does become immutable. And all, these, all this is possible because unikernels facilitate all, this, all these possibilities. So I'll now briefly cover <coughs> what a unikernel workflow might look like to give you an idea of how current developers are producing these. The first thing to point out is that the development cycle is familiar, and that's really important. So firstly, you build an application as you normally would on your development, on your development machine. The, the couple of differences here is that you use the libraries to represent the operating system components. So you link against those. 
and you try and avoid any dependencies on the traditional host OS. So try and avoid making system calls to your underlying system and instead use the libraries that are available. Then you, once you've built that, that application, you can test and measure it. And again, you can use familiar tools. Finally, you build this as a unikernel. And what I mean there is you change those system libraries to retarget the unikernel. So for example, you may be using some of the libraries to target to target a application running on Unix. And then ultimately, if you wish to deploy it to somewhere like the public cloud, you keep your application code and simply change out the system libraries to represent the target. In that case, it would be the Zen hypervisor, for example, and then recompile your unikernel so it will now run on the public cloud. So this is an example of the, of the development workflow. Essentially, develop as you normally would, do your testing and measurement, build the unikernel, and then deploy it. And a quick note about the tools that we use. All the familiar software development tools are available for you. And this includes continuous integration systems, which we see that the, pro the projects are already using, GDB is, is possible, profilers, linters, and even Dtrace. And part of this comes from the fact that there's an interesting side effect of using libraries for everything. Everything is in user space. So all the usual tools apply. And because there's no boundary between user space and kernel space, everything is just a function call. So you get much more visibility over what's going on in the system. And just remember that we're building things that are single purpose. And there are many unikernel implementations out there. There is a lot of open source software. There is a lot of activity in this space. So why are there so many of these? Well, each of these projects make different trade-offs. For example, we can think of clean slate versus code reuse. So clean slate, as I mentioned a few slides ago, uh, library operating systems simply provide the operating system constructs available as libraries. But how you get to those libraries, there are, there are different ways of doing that. One of those ways is to take a clean slate approach and build bespoke protocol implementations for all the pieces that you need. That's the kind of approach that Mirage OS has taken by rewriting things in OCaml and how VM has taken by rewriting things in Haskell. But you can also re you reuse all the existing battle-tested code that is out there. For example, the Rump Kernels project takes the battle-tested components of NetBSD and makes them available as libraries, which the Rump Run Unikernel can then use. So each of these projects that you can see on the right here make different trade-offs. And so hopefully by now you understand the need for unikernels and we've also demonstrated the range of activity that we have. And at this point, it's worth reminding everyone that unikernels are a new technology. The traditional approaches give limited benefits, but unikernels offer a new way to create and deploy applications. But as with any new technology, there are barriers to adoption. Developers have to adapt to new and varied tool chains to access this technology today. And because there are multiple projects, it means there are multiple tool chains involved. And we all know what, how that feels. And the deployments are not always as straightforward as they could be. So it's important for us to, that we must make unikernels more accessible to, the, to developers everywhere and much, much easier to deploy. <clears throat> and this is where Docker comes in. So I'll hand over now to uh, Richard Mortier, who will talk us through unikernels and Docker, and then give us a demo. Okay. Richard. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to talk through a little bit about how we see unikernels and Docker fitting together. So I think everybody's heard the, the phrase of build, ship, run. So Docker is there to help make it easy to build, ship, and run software. Um, in pursuing this aim, uh, there's a very well-known, very widely used tool chain now that's been built, um, and a very rich ecosystem around that to support use of that tool chain. Traditionally, I think this started with use of uh, supporting Linux containers, but isn't, that's now broadening out to also provide, for example, win Windows containers. Um, so I think there's, a, there's a, clan, a clear commonality here. Unikernels need better tooling. They need, they need to be made easier and more accessible to use and to deploy. Docker has uh, well-known, widely accepted tooling, widely used tooling, and a very broad ecosystem around that. So I think the two clearly fit together. So what we're trying to do is increase unikernel adoption here by bringing them into the Docker ecosystem so that this technology becomes available to all those people using these technologies. We've made some initial steps at trying to uh, do this. And so what I'll show in a couple of slides time is a short demo where we use 
uh, Docker to build and manage and run some unikernels. Specifically, <coughs> we'll use Docker to build un three unikernel microservices and run those in a cl little cluster to drive a web application that has the standard kind of LAMP stack elements. So there's going to be a MySQL database, there'll be Nginx providing a web server, and then there's a PHP code for Niblog. The build system for these is wrapped in the normal way in a Docker file. So uh, Docker build to create the unikernel image. Um, each microservice is then run as a specialized unikernel, and it runs in its own KVM virtual machine using the hardware protection that provides. The unikernels are then deployed and run and managed just as if they were Linux containers, essentially. So they're, they're managed through the, the normal Docker, Docker tool chain. This includes, for example, configuring networking on those unikernels as they're booted. And I think this hopefully will demonstrate that we can use it, unikernels and turn unikernels into a really useful, really awesome backend for a Docker deployment, but reuse a lot of the orchestration and management tools that have to sit around any such deployment. So I will now switch over to the demo. Uh, hopefully everybody can see that. So uh, if I begin by running a demo build. So this is building a Docker image. Uh, in this case, this is the, I believe, the Engine X image. Um, as you can see, that was a fairly standard sort of uh, process. So here we have the Docker build command being run, um, and we see the, the overlays being constructed. <clears throat> if you look at the size of this, so the size of the image that's been constructed, is this is a couple of megabytes on disk. Um, and it's worth noting that this is not for a single application that then got to sit on top of an operating system. This is the application linked with the system libraries that it will be using. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is a complete bootable image, essentially. This is a, a two meg bootable image. Um, if we then go to uh, running one of these, we can take the MySQL instance, and if we run that, uh, we see that the docker unikernel run command is being executed, and this has started that image. It's booted the, the MySQL unikernel image that was constructed um, and configured it to have uh, IP addresses and a gateway. Um, and if we now look at the logs from that, then, oops, if I type it correctly, uh, then you can see that the, the boot process has happened here. So run run unikernels uh, reused code taken from NetBSD. And you can see the boot, press take, boot process taking place here. Um, the difference being that when you get down towards the end of this process, instead of entering the normal uh, sort of init processes that and NetBSD would use, you're calling straight into MySQL. So this is the this is the example of this unikernel here is MySQL that's been linked against NetBSD libraries from the Rump kernel project and is able to then be booted as an instance, a microservice instance in its own right. So that hopefully shows uh, the first instance of this uh, microservice cluster coming up. So this is the MySQL database. Um, and just to prove that it is really uh, MySQL running, we can connect to that um, and then uh, execute the normal kinds of commands that you would expect to see, so showing the tables here. So this is, this is a normal MySQL instance. The application code there is MySQL. It's just it's, been run it's running now as a unikernel instance. Um, <clears throat> if I now boot the remainder of these images, these unikernels, so I'm running now the PHP nibble blog, and then I'm booting the Nginx instance as well, um, we can use Docker PS, and we can see that we do now have images running that can be managed through Docker. So we have uh, the Nginx uh, unikernel running there, we have the PHP nibble blog, and we have MySQL 1 that we ran a moment ago. Um, <coughs> excuse me. You can also see something that's interesting here or useful here is that Docker has configured these, or well, these have been configured using the Docker tools, so that both the PHP unikernel and the MySQL unikernel are not accessible from the host. They're not accessible from the outside world. They can only be talked to by going through the Nginx unikernel, which is the only one that's been made available. <coughs> um, and if I now run a web browser, I should be able to connect to the correct port, 32777. 
And we can see there that this is the Niblog software running. So this is connecting from uh, this laptop uh, that's sitting here, connecting through to the host uh, that's running these unikernels and then being able to talk through the Nginx unikernel to both the PHP, Niblog, and MySQL. <coughs> so hopefully that's given a flavor of the kinds of things we're working towards in terms of integrating unikernels with uh, the existing Docker tool chain and ecosystem. So just to reiterate there what happened. We ran three unikernels in a cluster that were configured to communicate together. Um, they were running standard LAMP stack components such as MySQL and PHP. Each of those unikernels was a small, secure OS image with only the functionality required in that image for that particular application. Um, the sort of sizes you see if you look at those unikernels on disk is between sort of two and six megabyte images. And that's for the full bootable image uh, and the application code. Hopefully you could see as they were booting there that the boot times were comparable to those of Linux containers, so less than a second. So the, these, these boots are not what you might get from booting a traditional OS, which might take a few seconds to come up. So we think we can see unikernels here, and we think that they, they really do seem to be very well targeted towards providing these kind of specialized microservices where each microservice is there to perform a single task. In that regard, then, they sit on a continuum with containers. You can run both alongside each other. You can manage both of these uh, through the Docker tool chain. So where you want to run traditional code that you don't want to try and turn into a unikernel for whatever reason, you can run that in a container in the way that you normally would. But in cases where there are particular components that may be more appropriate to specialize in this way, um, by unikernalizing them, as we've described, using generally fairly standard uh, development environments, just paying a little more attention to how you interact with system services, uh, you can turn applications and services like that into these very specialized, uh, very specific um, bootable instances called unikernels. <coughs> so in summary, I think we say that unikernels are a new way to develop applications. It's, it's libraries all the way down. Um, you have to pay some attention to the libraries you use and the attention to the way you interact with system services, but really uh, the, the rest of the application level development that goes on is, is very similar. And the result of this is to reduce the complexity and improve portability of these applications and improve the way that you can uh, retarget them to different environments. We've shown that unikernels can be managed using the Docker tool chain, at least uh, we've made some further steps towards that. Um, and in doing so, we get all the benefits of the Docker tool chain. So we can look at image management, we can do network and storage configuration, we can do all the things that Docker provides at the moment um, and start applying those, uh, using, reusing those features to manage unikernels as well. Having said all that, uh, I think it is still clear that this is still fairly early days. Unikernels are a very active area at the moment, they're developing very quickly, but there's a lot more work to come in terms of making them really, really easy to use and easy to de deploy. And with that, I think we can turn to Q&A. Thank you. Yeah, we have one question, uh, which is, can you please explain the network on the host? Are they using bridges or some other interface? And I think uh, Martin can take that question. Martin, are you there? Yep, I'm here. Um, okay, so the, the network on the host, <clears throat> in the case of this demo, is basically um, plugging into the, into the normal Docker Nort bridge. So essentially, um, from Docker's point of view, it looks just like a normal container, uh, except that we go through uh, a bunch of hoops to, to actually, rather than using an ethnos interface directly, Inside the container, we use a MacVTAP based interface in the container. Um, so yeah, um, this was this was this was put together for the proof of concept, which is the demo where we're working on more flexible ways of, of connecting this up and, and actually integrating the networking with the Docker infrastructure. But for those who are interested in how it works today, there's a pretty well documented set of steps in the GitHub repo for this demo. Okay, so there's another question of, are any businesses using unikernels in production today? So this is quite an interesting question because if you think about what unikernels actually are, it's essentially a single purpose, single address space image that is deployed somewhere. And so that model isn't necessarily new. So this idea has been around for quite a while and essentially what you find is out in the deep systems level system level um, world where with routers and switches and all those kinds of things, 
that's where you tend to find applications like this created and deployed. But as I mentioned at the very beginning, all of those make certain assumptions and they're tied to what they're being deployed on. So what we're doing here with Unikernel is essentially making it much, much easier to access that kind of development approach. So the idea of making a large collection of libraries so that people can build these Unikernels and deploy them everywhere. So part of the answer to that question is, yes, businesses are using Unikernels in production, but the modern Unikernel uh, approach that we're seeing today, the library operating systems that I mentioned earlier, yeah, those ones are just getting started. So another question here is, uh, if we co-host uh, unikernels and standard images, would we still need to have a host kernel? Um, <clears throat> I think the point to be made here is it, it does depend on the, the environment you're targeting. So if you're using Docker to manage unikernels alongside containers, for example, then clearly you need something that will support those containers. However, uh, one of the things that we alluded to at the start of the presentation I think is relevant here. So because unikernels make it so straightforward to retarget application code to different environments, um, you can take some of these unikernel technologies, the run run unikernel is a good example, where you can start to run some of these applications on the bare metal. So you can create a unikernel, which is the only thing that will run on the device. Um, and this is particularly relevant perhaps to Internet of Things and other uh, deployment environments such as that. <coughs> Similarly, uh, with some of the unikernel systems uh, such as Mirage uh, and HalVM as well, uh, the output that you build is a Zen virtual machine, which you can then boot and run on the Zen hypervisor. Um, without requiring a host operating system to host it. You have the hypervisor, you have the DOM0, but then the booted instance, the unikernel instance, is a running virtual machine. So I think the, the thing to bear in mind here is that unikernel, part of the point of using unikernels is to make it easy to retarget to these different environments. Okay. So another question that we've seen, thanks for all the questions, there are, we see a lot of them coming in. So is there any plan to support EC2 backends? Um, well, yes, being able to deploy to the existing infrastructure that we have today is really important, and that's one of the things that we're working on. Uh, another question I see here is, can unikernels work directly on hardware without the base OS? And so, yeah, yes, is the short answer to that. Um, essentially, what you need to do here, then, is also pull in the device drivers that are required in producing that image. And this is an example where uh, rump kernels and the rump run unikernel do very, very well because all those device drivers are made available. So it is possible to target directly onto, hi onto hardware by using, by using library op operating systems. Um, so I'll take one here uh, asking about ARM compatible unikernels. Are ARM compatible unikernels available? Uh, they certainly are, thanks. I, I run these myself using, in this case, the Mirage OS system and the Zen hypervisor uh, running on ARM, ARM devices such as the Kiwi Board 2. Um, so building unikernels there to boot on those devices uh, works just fine. Um, it's also worth just saying, because a number of these questions are coming in, that unikernels are a kind of a general technology, a general approach, and different unikernel projects are at different stages and are focusing on different aspects of that. So to date, uh, the Mirage OS project, for example, is focused on um, Zen uh, for deployments. It's focused on uh, development in a standard kind of POSIX environment, be that OSX or Linux, uh, and it's also more recently focused on building uh, to deploy to uh, ARM small, low, uh, small form factor ARM devices. But other systems out there have focused in different different ways. Okay. Another question I see here is what type of applications and use cases would derive the most benefit from Unikernel? So this is where we mentioned earlier about the idea of things like microservices and small single purpose applications. So uh, one example that was recently being used is Mirage OS. One of the contributors to Mirage OS built a firewall VM, which he's using on his development machine. Uh, he uses Cubes OS on his development machine. And so that firewall is a single purpose virtual machine built using Mirage OS. So that's one use case where it's actually quite, quite helpful. The Mirage OS DNS server is another example where we've been able to build a single purpose single-purpose machine that performs this task and doesn't need to do anything else. I happen to be using Mirage OS more, more often in my examples purely because I'm more familiar with that project. Um, so there's a couple here I can take, I think. So uh, one question came in about these demo examples, and yes, they are available in GitHub. Uh, if you go to github.com, uh, I can say if you look at devel.unikernel.org, I just put a post there that has a link to the, to the repo. No, even better, even easier. Um, 
Another one uh, question has come up, what skills should I have in order to contribute to the Unicorn project? I think uh, the best thing to do there is to really get engaged with the Unicorn.org website and the develop Unicorn.org forum. Um, and really find one of the Unicorn projects that matches your interests and skills already. So if you're an expert NetBSD hacker, for example, then I think the Rump Kernel is probably the place to go start looking. Um, if you're already uh, you know, well-versed in how to program in Haskell, then the HalVM is probably the place to go. So there's, there's a wide variety of them out there. They're documented on that website. We're looking for more. If there are other systems out there, that, other Unicorn systems out there that would like to be listed, we're very happy to, to add those. We really want to see this community building. And I think the thing to do would be to pick the one that best fits your skills and interests already. Yes, I can definitely echo that. There's there's a lot of activity in our projects, and all the projects are very keen to have more contributors. So there's a question that's come up, uh, what's the difference between unikernels and microkernels? Um, that's an interesting one. I think if you look at the... Look at the development of library operating systems in the 90s that was mentioned. I think that's where this different kind, difference kind of comes out. So you can look at traditional monolithic kernels where all of the system services that you use are wrapped up into this, this large monolith, the kernel. Um, and that was observed in the 90s to lead to some difficulties. If, for example, you wanted to support real-time media at, the, at, on, at that time, what you found was that because all the processes that were running were sharing the same infrastructure underneath them, uh, in the kernel, uh, they would interfere with each other, and it was difficult to give guaranteed performance to any of those processes. Microkernels micro uh, improved on that situation to some extent by taking some of those services out of the kernel and running them as, as essentially user space demons that would then have to, have to communicate. However, you still have the problem that you have to, um, you have multiple applications interacting in relatively unconstrained ways by using these, these, micro, these service instances that are supporting the microkernel that they sit underneath. Unikernels are very much more in the library operating system mode where all of the, li the system services that you need are linked into the same image, so they're linked into the application. So it becomes very much easier to account, and that was the, the concern at the time, very much easier with library operating systems, very much easier to account resource usage to the application that's running. I think what we're doing here is we're taking that approach um, and observing some of the other benefits you can get from that kind of library, library operating system approach where you want to be able to easily retarget, for example, the different environments. And you can do that because you, when you write your applications, you pay, if you pay a little more attention to how you interact with system services and you encapsulate the system services that you interact with in libraries, you can then swap out implementations of libraries to target different systems. So this is, for example, in Mirage OS, we target joint development. You target the standard uh, POSIX environment on which you're running. Um, so you get to use all the normal tools that you would expect to use to develop applications. And then simply by changing a, a flag at the compilation phase, or the configuration and then compilation phase of the application, um, you can then link different libraries that allow you to target the Zen virtual machine, for example. Okay. Uh, there's a question here about since the library is modularized, is it easy to maintain those libraries? For example, if you need to apply a security patch. Well, that's one of the benefits of having libraries. It's essentially libraries all the way down. And if there is a patch to one of those libraries, recompilation of your Unicorn is actually really straightforward. So typically for the ones that we're familiar with, it's a few seconds to recompile and then deploy the new version. So yes, it's actually really straightforward. And again, because it's libraries everywhere, you're not necessarily responsible for, have to be responsible for maintaining all of them because the ecosystem should grow and different people will maintain different aspects of the libraries. Just like we do with open source software in any other area today. There are libraries out there, you choose which ones you need, other people help you maintain them, and it's generally open source goodness. Okay, uh, there's a couple of questions here that I think Martin uh, would like to take to answer. Yeah, um, there, was, there was a question about uh, how is the set of OS libraries needed for the app determined? And also a related question about how much space would a MySQL image take compared to a normal Docker image, and how do we know, how do we get all these libraries that we need into it? Um, so, in, in the case of, of Rump Run Unikernels, which is what you'd want to run MySQL on, um, the build system that we that we've designed, or, or the user visible build system, basically you build MySQL using its unmodified build system as a cross compile, right? And you link in the libraries um, that MySQL needs, which you also build as packages from source. Um, and then at the end of the day, you use this tool called Rump Bake which takes your 
MySQL binary, and which is kind of which is partially linked, and finishes the linking process by linking in the unikernel components, which are needed for the for the target that you're targeting. So that might be um, that might be KVM or Zen or, or bare metal on x86 or on ARM. Um, so so the answer is that basically the there's, there's a tool chain in place that that takes care of most of this for you. Um, and I also wanted to answer a question someone asked, why is KVM required? It's it's not required. Um, KVM is used in this demo simply because it's the easiest way to show a demo with containers and unikernels running alongside on a Docker host, given that a Docker host is by definition can use KVM. Um, is there anything else you'd like me to take, folks? Not right now. There's one, there's, there's one that's popped up uh, that's still responding. So asking about talking through debugging and troubleshooting apps running on a unikernel rather than a traditional kernel. I think uh, there's, there's a, a kind of several responses to this. The first one is, uh, as we discussed uh, in the presentation, that a lot of the work that you do when developing unikernel is actually just application development. That we're paying a little more attention to the libraries you use. And when you're doing that application development, you're doing that in a familiar environment using all the tools you might want to use. So if you, if you like using DDB, you use DDB. If you like using printf, as I do, you use printf. Um, and you do all that work so that you get your application code, you try and get your application code running correctly before you start trying to think about turning it into a unikernel. Um, when you do need to turn it into a unikernel, you then have access, depending on the unikernel uh, platform you're using, if you like, uh, you have access to different debugging tools and different different capabilities there. So uh, you can use, for example, Dtrace in some of these systems. You can use, uh, in the Mirage system, we have some uh, custom libraries that help do tracing and profiling of unikernels that give you quite nice visualizations of how your, how your Mirage application, your Mirage unikernel, is running and operating. Um, so I think there's a, the, the comment there is really there's a spectrum of tools that are available, a number of which will be familiar. Uh, a number of which will be uh, specific to the Unicorn environment you're running on. Having said all that, I think there's a couple, another, couple, another, of, another couple of interesting things, uh, opportunities that Unicorns may provide um, in terms of uh, developing software, developing reliable software in debugging. Uh, the first one is that, um, as Amir mentioned, I think, because it's po quite likely, quite possible, that uh, because you have, don't have this, this opaque boundary through which you can't see the kernel user space boundary, everything is turning into libraries that you're just making function calls to, it could well be the case that you can get more detailed information out in the case of a problem um, because you can see all the way up and down the stack here rather than having this barrier that is more difficult to see through. The second is that, um, and this again depends on the particular Unicorn platform you're using, but some of these platforms such as HalVM, such as perhaps as uh, Mirage with the OCaml and Haskell heritage, um, may make it more easy to apply uh, proof tools and other forms of formal methods that will uh, help make your programs, hopefully, more reliable before you get to the stage of having to debug them. So uh, I guess there's, uh, there's almost a philosophical thing behind Unicorns here. If you try and front load a lot of the work that you need to do, so you front load the debugging into trying to prove the code to be correct to a greater extent, you can try and front load um, the, uh, the retargeting, the porting uh, experience, uh, the porting work that you might have to do by encapsulating platform dependencies in libraries and then being able to swap those in and out. So I think, uh, to summarize all that, in many cases you can use existing tools and you will use existing tools to develop the application first before uni unikernelizing it. For many of the unikernel platforms that exist, you can already use some of the existing tools that are available. For those that don't have those, the, those tools available, um, there's, I think, I don't see any fundamental reason why uh, those tools could not be ported to support those platforms. That those platforms are still very much actively under development. These are still fairly new technologies. Um, and finally, I think there's the opportunity, the potential certainly with these kind of approaches to do a lot better, uh, a lot sooner in terms of applying developments in formal methods over the last 20 years to make code more reliable even in some sense before you write it. So. Okay, I think, uh, Martin, I think you also have some comments you'd like to add about that. Um, yeah, I think I think an important point to make is that um, the the applications that you develop 
or that you want to run as unikernels, uh, you can develop these as normal user space applications, both in the case of Mirage and in the case of Rump Run. So for Mirage, you can develop, test, debug, thrash your software in user space as a normal user space application, then retarget it to a unikernel and run it as unikernel. For Rump Run, because it's a cross compilation of your normal POSIX software, you can do exactly the same thing. So um, wh while I agree that, that we have we have a way to improve in terms of operational debugging, in, in terms of introspection and, and, and getting getting stuff out of the uni, out of the unikernel. There's nothing fundamental uh, fundamentally missing that will let you debug um, your software as you develop it. Um, also, there are a couple of questions asking whether or not um, lib network will work with unikernels and whether the docker unikernel command shown would support driver options and so on. Um, so the answer is uh, yes, at least for lib network. Yes, for lib network drivers, once we have um, real integration with Docker in place. So the Docker unikernel command chain is just a demo. It's just a wrapper. Um, it probably won't be very happy if you try doing things with drivers, but um, it might work. Okay, there was also, we should point out that this um, presentation is being recorded and we're going to be posting it at some point later. There was a, an interesting question, I think, um, if you're new to kernel programming, might Unikernel be a good method to, say, learn about things like networking while not being involved in the uh, other, other code? Well, since you're also attached to university, you might find it interesting to answer this question. I think that, so uh, a specific part of this question here was uh, to learn Linux networking, and it, I guess that would depend very much on the type of Unikernel platform you were you're investigating. Um, I think learning Linux networking by looking at the Mirage networking stack is perhaps not, not going to be the most efficient way of doing that. On the other hand, looking at something like the Mirage networking stack or the HAL VM networking stack or how uh, rump kernels uh, uh, configure and operate, I think these can be very good ways of getting involved in systems pr level programming initially because um, there, there's, a, there's a, a wide diversity of implementations there that you can look at and compare. Um, a number of these now have, these unikernel systems now have very complete, or relatively speaking, complete implementations. But because they are, in some cases, clean slate implementations, they don't have necessarily all the legacy and all the other complexity and baggage that comes with uh, a system that's been, been around for as long as Linux has. So I think I'd certainly, I think they're, they're an interesting place to go to if you want to look at how different systems level concepts, if you like, are implemented in different ways. But if you're looking to learn specifically about Linux networking, uh, then I'm not, it, it, I don't think I would, I would start out looking, I certainly wouldn't look at the ones I'm familiar with, uh, namely Mirage and uh, Wow. So, and something to add to that is that this is essentially all just code. So, as Richard mentioned, we essentially have a, a, we've taken what is what is an operating system, a large, complicated piece of code, and made everything available as a library. So, it, it can be a very good way to understand how those systems work. And just to add to that, that it's it, it's all just code. Everything is code. So, this idea of systems systems um, being complicated. It goes away. It's more. So I should, uh, sorry, and the other thing I forgot to say was that um, because of the way that these things are constructed, uh, they're actually a good platform for experimentation as well. So you can you can pick and choose a little bit what you're putting into your system, and you can start to really get get your hands dirty and see what the the effect of doing that is. Um, where it's maybe it is a bit harder in some ways to do that with with these larger kind of legacy systems. So there's a question about how much change would one have to make to a legacy or existing application in order to run it as a unikernel. And this is an interesting question. So this also depends on the type of unikernel implementation you're using. So if you want to, say, use one of the clean slate implementations like Mirage OS or HalVM, then you would have to write your application in OCaml or Haskell, respectively. However, it is also possible to take legacy software, as in the demo you've just seen, and deploy that as a unikernel. And I'll call on Martin to talk about what changes may or may not have been needed to the legacy software there. Um, so the amount of changes that we had to make to, to the components that you saw, that you saw there, um, that was MySQL, Nginx, and PHP were virtually nil. Um, so there were, there were zero code changes made to any of those applications. Um, 
the the biggest hurdle with uh, when you want to to build legacy applications under run, run is you need proper support for, for cross compiling in the build system. Um, out of the out of the applications there, um, PHP was basically trivial because it just uses GNU autoconf and the cross compilation there just worked. Nginx, um, we found some patches that um, that the folks for Open Embedded Build Root had already done, and they just worked. Uh, MySQL was actually the biggest um, the biggest pain there. So, but yeah, most of it is fighting with build systems. Um, I'm sure a lot of you can agree that a large chunk of every software engineer's day is spent fighting with build systems. Um, but once you sort that out, no code changes. Okay, and just to add to that, so we've talked briefly about um, Mirage OS, LVM, and we've heard from Martin about using Rump kernels to make Rump run Unicorn. There's also other projects out there. For example, Include OS, which is a C++ implementation of a Unicorn, will also work fairly well with existing legacy software. And uh, a further point to say there is, is to get an overview of some of the work that's going on here, um, probably could mention as well the Cloud Innovators Forum that took place at the Scale 40 Next conference uh, over the weekend. Uh, down in LA, um, and uh, there, there were a number of talks there actually that gave kind of the state of the art of some of these systems in, from involving environments from uh, Mirage through uh, uh, Mirage running on KVM using Solo 5 through to uh, the Erlang based unikernel system. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a good spectrum there of, of different systems to try and engage with and, and go and have a look at, depending as, as I think we've said, on what your interests are, what your current, current expertise is. Yeah. And one of the things that we need to start working on is helping to bring those projects together to highlight more of them to the growing developer community. Because as we mentioned, there are a lot of them and sometimes they're difficult. It's not so, it's not so straightforward to get started with all of them. But if we can bring people to Unikernels in a, in, a, in a way that involves lots of tooling that helps people get started, that helps people begin contributing to each of the different projects, that's going to be really, really beneficial for Unikernels as a whole. And, and the Docker tool chain is something that will help with that. So we've also mentioned a few times in here, like you can see on this slide, devel.unikernel.org. That's essentially where people can go to get involved in the development of development activities. So you'll see that um, several of us there comments there. I've made a post to reference, reference this um, Docker online meetup. And so I'm afraid we couldn't get through all the questions here today. Hopefully there are some others. We can have some more interesting discussion on, on that forum. And in the long term, we hope that unikernel.org, that community website, becomes a, a gathering hole for all the different projects to learn from each other and to help raise the tide for Unikernels uh, in general. So with that, I think we should start wrapping up this. Just to remind everyone again that this presentation is being recorded and it'll be posted sometime later. Uh, you can find more information about Unikernels and the implementations via unikernel.org. There will be, there's a forum with links and you can reach out to any of us you've heard on the call today as well. Okay, thank you.